Hello and welcome to what is now our fourth video in the Intel series on the path to the cloud. Today we're looking at modern application development, which can sometimes be a little confusing, particularly when you get to concepts like microservices, containers, and of course the various distributions of Kubernetes, which is the most widely deployed management platform. As usual, no sales pitching here. This is really intended to be free to customer, free to cloud consumer information from deep subject matter experts who've lived and been through these deployments at scale. So today I'm joined by Sashin Ashtakar, Jose Ramirez and Joe Carvalho. So gentlemen, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do at Intel. Uh, Sashin, can we start with you? Absolutely. Thank you, Phil. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me today. My name is Sachin Ashtikar, and I am a principal engineer in the CTO office at Intel IT, focused on cloud and containers. I'm also a product owner for Containers as a Service Initiative at Intel. I've uh, been working on container technology from the last five years, and very excited to be part of this discussion today. Thanks, Sachin, and great to have you. Uh, next, let's go to Jose. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Cambronero Ramirez and I'm a principal engineer in the IT infrastructure and information security team. And today's topic is really exciting for me because I've been working in IT infrastructure related roles for the past 17 years. And I've witnessed firsthand the evolution of compute infrastructure to get to where we're at today with containers. So thank you for having me here. Excellent, and last not, but not least, uh, Joe, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Phil. Thank you for asking. Uh, my name is Joe Carvalho. I'm a principal engineer in a group called CESG inside of Intel. Uh, and we work with the largest cloud co computing providers in the world uh, on modernization technologies and initiatives. And I've been in this field from an engineering perspective for roughly 23 years now. Excellent. Thank you so much. So before we get into the subject matter deeply, it might be I think, useful just to define our terms here. Perhaps we could just have a quick overview of what are containers and why bother with them. Jose, could we go to you for this one? Absolutely, Phil. So containers are basically a form of operating system level virtualization, where typically you take an entire application along with all of its dependencies, like binaries, files, packages, and so forth. You take them all and compress them into a single container. Containers are often compared with virtual machines because they are considered the next level evolution of virtual machines. However, there are many differences between virtual machines and containers. For example, a container does not need a hypervisor or a guest operating system. Now, immediately with that, you can deduce that containers are generally much smaller in size, and therefore, these are what it's considered portable, which means that you could potentially take a container and pretty much run it anywhere as long as a compatible runtime is available. Also, the smaller size means better density, meaning that you can take more containers than virtual machines and run them in a single host. Lastly, containers can run in both virtual machines and physical servers. There are other differences between virtual machines and containers that could be called out, but hopefully this provides some clarity into what containers are and how they are different from virtual machines. Yeah, thanks. I think that's an excellent summary. So now we know what they are. I think the next question is, why bother with them? What are the benefits? Uh, Sashin, could we go to you for this one? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, why bother? Uh, I think, uh, Phil, if you, uh, if you look back, we had an evolution you know, decades ago around moving from physical to virtual machines, and that's what we call P2V, and for many different benefits that you know, even we are enjoying today. However, with cloud uh, evolution uh, essentially propelled you know, innovation everywhere at a very sheer pace. And what happened because of that is new, new business requirements have seen new uh, design models such as microservices take a prominence. Ability to scale anywhere quickly has almost become a necessity. With all those changing needs, the existing model has seen some limitations, I would say. And that's where the containers comes to rescue. So really, Phil, if I had to summarize, why bother? Containers bring agility for your business, 
portability for your solutions, optimization for your operations team, and velocity for your developers. And that's why we should, you know, keep looking at containers as a part of your overall ecosystem. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much. And I suppose then the last question is, how might one's perspectives differ depending on what somebody does in the organization, particularly between, for instance, application development and IT operations? Uh, Joe, we haven't heard from you yet. Do you have a view here? I do, Phil. Thank you for asking. From a development point of view, containers essentially create a new capability. Uh, it's, it's actually been around for a while, but it allows us to very quickly package all of the necessary components and needs from an application point of view, and then bring it very quickly into an operational deployment mechanism. So it essentially makes code operational, if you will, and, and enables acceleration of delivery of that code. But the, the, the powerful aspect from a developer point of view is you can break down your individual application capabilities into what's called microservices. They're essentially their own functions, and it allows you to zero in on the pieces of your code that you want to be able to scale. So it allows us to very, very much focus on key capabilities while allowing the application to, to scale rather quickly. And it's a very powerful capability when you look at it from a developer point of view. Yeah, good stuff. So that's all very nice so far. I mean, would anyone have a view on, so what happens when we want to deliver these at scale? Yes, yes. This, these are excellent points that Joe is bringing up. In, but I have to say, when we start to think about the elements that, that Joe is clearly calling out, such as this distributed nature of containers, how they communicate to each other and how they scale, we have to introduce a key element that brings that glue, the cohesion of all these moving parts. This is a core concept of containers, and it's called the orchestrator. The orchestrator is what takes containers to the next level by bringing into the table multiple features that can enable high availability, resiliency, scalability, a scheduling, low distribution, rolling upgrades, and many, many other capabilities that are required to consider your containers ready for production prime time. Thanks. So the most common management platform that we see out there is Kubernetes. I wonder what else exists or what earlier frameworks have led to this? And what are the de facto standards that people should be considering as they enter this world? Um, Sashin, can we come back to you for this? Yes, Phil, uh, absolutely. I think as Jose mentioned, right, Kubernetes uh, has, you know, is really an orchestration that glues you know, all these different moving parts in this ecosystem together. In the earlier days, we had various different orchestration uh, frameworks that are out there as it was all evolving. But today, Kubernetes has become a de facto standard for orchestration. Now, there are various different ways you could start consuming the Kubernetes for your own requirements. And essentially, I, I look at it in, you know, we have three different options. One option is using Kubernetes directly from your open source community. Uh, second option is vendors packaging Kubernetes along with their support uh, for you to consume. And the third one is really cloud service providers offering that as an offering in their cloud, uh, essentially. No matter, based on what your strategy is, you could consume one or more of these offerings. Just one thing to keep in mind though, in the process, uh, let's not deviate from the native Kubernetes offering uh, that we have out there, because that is what will give you the you know flexibility and the portability in the future. You know, as long as we keep that in mind, you could really start consuming you know from various different options I just laid out here. That's great stuff, and I think you make a couple of interesting points there. I think one that the whole open source movement was actually designed to get people out of proprietary stacks and therefore commoditizes the hardware layer somewhat. And of course, as we get further in, into abstraction, the question arises, does the hardware actually matter anymore? Mm -hmm. Jose, what do you think about this? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Phil. I, I can tell you that based on our experience of running containers in production for several years, we have seen many use cases. But at least from a hardware perspective, I think we are able to categorize what we've seen in at least two big buckets. The number one is what I will consider you know, the rather simple use cases, also known as stateless workloads, where as long as you provide the compute resources that a container requires, mainly CPU and memory, then the hardware is not as critical. However, use case number two, as the use cases evolve and workloads mature, then this is when we start seeing that hardware starts to matter. Typically, you know, use cases that, that are also known as 
stateful workloads where the storage matters, then of course the performance of the storage backend matters too. Additionally, use cases where the hardware that the container requires is embedded into the host, such as FPGA, VPUs, or GPUs, then absolutely the hardware matters and it will be critical for the success of the use cases. And if I could just add from a development point of view, when an application is initially being built, you're focused very much on just the core functionality. What is the thing that you're trying to build? What sort of business purpose does this application provide? But eventually, if this application is a business critical function, as the demand for the application increases, it is naturally going to have to scale and ultimately perform. And this is a really important concept. When you think about the evolution of building and deploying an application, it typically starts from a functional point of view, but very quickly, it can move to a performance and scalability point of view. And as an example, when you think about something like a distributed application, performance is a very critical element in the capabilities that a distributed application actually provides and distributed analytics in general. Yeah, thanks. And Joe, I know I've heard you say before that performance never matters and, until it does. So great points there. So with this, we have a range of complexities and challenges facing us, particularly with regards to deployment options. How did Intel address these challenges? Sashi, and I think you had a major role in this. Yes, Phil. So for Intel, uh, you know, obviously with, with with this type of abstractions that we're bringing in, you know, the complexity is obviously exists, but we are pushing it down. Uh, in my head, really managing this complexity is two things. One is simplification and standardization. So on the software side, what we have done is we have we have adopted open source uh, standard offering and you know, for our containerization. We have we do not deviate from it. And if we have to change any of those uh, offerings in the stack, we take a very pragmatic approach around why the change is required. Uh, because standardization is key uh, in managing the complexity. That's number one. And then on the infrastructure side, from the word uh, from the get go, we had uh, we had taken a simplification approach. We should simplify as much as possible. For example, today, majority of our deployments that we have on prem are running on bare metal servers. That is avoiding additional, you know, complexity that may arise due to virtualization layer, uh, at, you know, related cost, and then you essentially maximizing your resources that you have. So those are the two things I would uh, recommend uh, thinking through: standardization and simplification for complexity. And if I could just add, from a deployment point of view, uh, there are some common patterns that we find today from a Kubernetes uh, deployment perspective. Uh, typically, you're, what we find is roughly 80% or more containers are actually deployed on top of virtual machines, uh, and there are very good reasons for doing that. Uh, but one of the other common patterns that we start to see where performance actually matters, uh, or performance is a critical measurable element in the deployment of that application, uh, is a bare metal Kubernetes deployment. Essentially, you have the hardware, then you have an operating system running on top of the hardware, and then you have the container engine and the runtimes above, obviously, with Kubernetes managing it all. Um, and then finally, there's an emerging pattern. Uh, it's small, but it's emerging. And we're finding virtual machines actually inside of containers. And as an example, kubevert is a good example of an initiative uh, that is meant to solve that specific pattern. And there are reasons for all three. Thank you so much. And it's really interesting. One of the most common questions we get asked by customers is, OK, I understand what containerization is. I understand why I should do it. And I've got various deployment options. But where are my quick wins? Are there certain applications which might be more suited to containerization than others? Jose, what would you say to that? Yeah, good question, Phil. Uh, in theory, you could take any software that is not a system level software and put it into a container. However, we have to be practical. We need to prioritize what are those use cases that can give us the greater value, you know, and identify the major patterns and trends that can provide that higher value that we're looking for. From our experience, we have been able to identify four major trends. Number one is all about software vendors. So, you know, it's not a surprise that software vendors are taking the container deployment route to distribute their software, uh, ensuring that it can work pretty much anywhere. So trend number one is about choosing the container deployment route whenever it's available for installing the software from your vendors. 
Trend number two is about your own internal teams trying to provide a platform or a solution as a service. And what better way to do that but using containers where you can you know, provide your tenants and your customers higher, higher levels of control and flexibility that they require. The trend number three is all about continuous integration and continuous delivery. Basically, software builds, tests, validations, happening simultaneously across many versions at a very rap rapid pace. And containers in this specific trend bring a powerful benefit of speed and hardware efficiency. Lastly, trend number four is all about external collaboration. Containers enable you to work and collaborate with your external partners and customers through a standard approach where anyone can contribute using container native development, testing, and delivery models. That's really thorough, thank you. So now let's assume that we have customers who are ready to dip their toes in and get started with containerization. How would they future-proof? How would you know that what you're doing now is going to be good still when you start to deploy at scale? And perhaps we could go around the group for this one because it's a really important question. Sasha, could we start with you and then we'll go to Jose and Joe? Absolutely, Phil. That's a fantastic question. Uh, for me, future proofing, uh, we, you know, it's a very, you know, very simple two prime approach. You know, from the uh, from the strategy perspective, uh, alignment to the open source community uh, is absolutely the key. As long as you stay aligned to the open source community strategically, you know, that will give an advantage. You know, from the future proofing perspective, and then from the execution perspective, keeping your environments current. You know, no matter how small or big those environments are, do not fall behind. Those two things will essentially give you all the goodness, uh, you know, as we see a rapid pace of innovation in this space. And you could, you know, almost say that you are future proof, you know, if you just follow these two uh, strategies. Yes, this, these are excellent points, Sachin. And if I may add, I also think that having a fully allocated team with a strong DevOps skill is critical for success. We're talking about expert level skills around containers, Kubernetes, and the operational tools around them. The team must also excel at customer support and be able to understand the customer workloads and requirements because you will encounter a wide variety of use cases from customers with different skills. So partnering with your customers to define resilient architecture patterns, having the right training material, an active community of users, and self-help portals are all critical to support a continuous and healthy adoption of containers in the long term. And those are all excellent points, uh, Sachin and Jose. I want to add one additional uh, or a couple of additional points. From a future-proofing point of view, in adopting and deploying uh, uh, container-based technologies and leveraging Kubernetes enables a very powerful set of capabilities for a company, uh, for any organization. And when you think about it, uh, essentially there are two layers when you deploy these technologies and you have your containers and then you have the service layer on top, which is really the portion that is consumed uh, by the end user as an example. So what happens is as new technology emerges and you want to enhance your application, it allows you to basically spin up an additional container that takes advantage of that new capability, if you will, if it's a new hardware acceleration capability. And what you can do is once you deploy that new container with the additional capability, you can leverage technologies that allow you to do something called a canary deployment so that only a certain percentage of the traffic to that application is actually going to this new container. And once you gain the confidence, the operational trust that it's functioning as expected, you can open up the, uh, the doors, if you will, and essentially increase uh, the number of connections. And it almost seamlessly allows you to continue, continue to uh, leverage it and actually deploy new capabilities very, very quickly, which is the whole point of the technologies that we're talking about today. Thanks to all of you for those great and I think very thorough answers. I feel like we've covered a lot in a very short space of time. Perhaps if we could close off, if there was just one takeaway you'd like the audience to get from this, what would it be? And let's go in the same order. Perhaps we could start with you, Sashin, then Jose, and then Joe. Sure, Phil. I think the benefits, the value we discussed so far, uh, ultimately will come, will come from the adoption. Uh, so you should pay really, you know, plan and pay close attention uh, to bringing your users, your consumers along with you on this journey. Uh, do not underestimate how much time and efforts you may have to spend in there as well. That would be my 
you know one take away uh, you know in this whole containerization journey phil i completely agree with sachin phil we're seeing a massive adoption of containers and it's only going to increase therefore my key message is about making that adoption as smooth by providing to your internal customers when the, what the industry refers to as a containers as a service platform this is a standard secure a scalable and reliable platform that your containers users can leverage without having to worry about the complexities and the moving parts of containers leaving them to focus on what really matters which is their workloads and their applications and have a team that is fully dedicated to manage and support the containers as a service platform and its underlying infrastructure in order to maximize the value of containers in your organization and if i might add containers essentially unlock innovation they operationalize code and speed up the delivery process but it's really important to understand the life cycle of of these technologies and specifically the application everywhere from the core functionality that's being created and delivered all the way through the levels of scale and performance that that application will naturally need to be capable of as demand increases it's also really important that as the dev and the ops come together uh, that the organizations are very tightly aligned with that pipeline and how it works end to end and that typically enables a very robust uh, capability within the organization where it can move just as fast as the business actually requires thanks gentlemen all excellent points i do hope that you've enjoyed listening to this that you found it useful if you'd like to dig any deeper into any of the topics that we've discussed here there are some links provided at the bottom of the page thank you again for listening and we hope to see you all next time 